morning, Francesco. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Where this interview finds you? I would say New York from the back. Yeah, that's uh, where I'm located, although my team is based in California. So I'm kind of stretched between the two coasts of the United States right now. Wow, it's a lot of traveling. And, and what is your current role for our public? So my, my role is uh, Director of Regulatory Affairs uh, with uh, Impossible Foods. And obviously, I need to make here a disclaimer because anything I will say and communicate in the next hour or so doesn't necessarily represent uh, what my company think about the topics we will deal with. So this is only my point of view. Of course, um, that's great. Of course, we, we won't uh, dig into confidential info, but uh, you have a really very interesting career. We met, I guess, the first time around 2010 when you finish your uh, yeah. it was PhD, probably, Correct. in yeah. Cattolica, uh, the University of Cattolica in Piacenza. So if you can tell us more about your, your, your career, your former experience in, in other companies, it would be great. Yeah, so um, I started with a legal education uh, like you, Cesare, in Italy, although in a smaller university at the University of Trento, which is located uh, close to Austria, although it's part of Italy. Um, so towards the, the last year of my uh, law degree, I decided to invest my time in studying food law. And back then there was no uh, formal curriculum or education and food law. And so I decided to develop my uh, uh, food law thesis with Professor Izzo and Professor Matteo Ferrari, who is now professor of food law at the University of Trento on uh, drinking water and bottled water. It was an interesting um, research about comparing regulation both in, in the European Union and the US. And then I went on, um, as you mentioned, with the uh, PhD at the Agrosystem PhD School in Piacenza, which is a, a branch of the Catholic University. And the reason why I joined that PhD is because it's one of the few experiences in Europe of uh, multidisciplinary PhD. Um, so not only it welcomes uh, law students, but also students in uh, agricultural economics, food science, animal uh, production and so on and so forth. And it was an excellent experience because uh, not only I was exposed to food science and cultural science there, which obviously during uh, the regular legal curriculum in Europe, you don't have any contact with, uh, but also I had two opportunities to intern abroad. First one was at the European Commission, what uh, then was DG Sante, Sorry, DG Sanco, which nowadays is uh, DG yeah. Sante. Correct. And then um, I moved to the US for the first time. And uh, I did an internship at Me Johnson Nutrition, which is a global leader in pediatric nutrition. And uh, while doing my internship, I also finished my PhD. And uh, I was gladly to have as advisors, uh, besides uh, Professor Talakini, I had also. Uh, professor Martinol, who is now a uh, professor of food law at the Hamburg, Hamburg University of Applied Sciences, yeah. and Professor Neil Fortino, who is professor, uh, adjunct, uh, associated professor of food law at Michigan State University. Um, and I, I did my uh, PhD dissertation on the policy model to manage food safety crises. And this was also a comparative work between uh, European law and US law. And so mm -hmm. then I ended up joining Me Johnson Nutrition. There I was a regulatory, senior regulatory specialist. Uh, but towards the fourth year with Me Johnson, I decided it was time to come back to Europe, which I did. And uh, I passed, afterwards, I passed three years with Ferrero in Luxembourg. Uh, where the headquarter of Ferrero International is located. And I was senior counsel. That was a unique experience because I supported innovation, um, which I started to support also in Johnson Nutrition, but with Ferrero was the specific focus of my task. And I 
gladly supported the sugar reduction platform, um, which worked with, uh, within Ferrero and the open innovation team, which had recently established in Ferrero. So I, I touch upon a lot of topics dealing with innovation, novel foods, and uh, innovative ingredients. Um, toward, and then also what was interesting in that period is that I had the opportunity to participate in several food industry organizations such as Food Drink Europe, uh, Cow Bisco, uh, but also the counterparts here in the US, uh, Consumer Brands Association and uh, American Baker Association. And so towards uh, the third year with uh, Ferrero, then I move again to the US uh, with Ferrero USA. And I was there for two years, um, which led me to deal more with, uh, let's say, consumer facing problems, labeling and communication of products here in the US, and also supporting the new acquisition that Ferrero had done uh, in the previous years in the field of uh, cookies, and bake goods. And then recently this year, I decided to leave Ferrero for this new adventure with Impossible Food, which is one of the leader in the plant-based food here in the US. And, uh, and this move was also, let's say, uh, driven by an interest and desire to investigate new ingredients and technology because Impossible Food obviously is one of the most innovative companies right now, at least that's what I think. Uh, in the US and uh, on the global scale, let's say. Super. Um, you have really an invaluable expertise, uh, you know, on both sides of the oceans. You had great mentors like Martin Olle and Faltrin. So this should be enough to let understand the people uh, online uh, the level of your expertise. But I have to say that Francesco is one of the, honestly, uh, top professionals I worked with uh, along these years. Uh, we met in several conferences, also at Michigan State, and yeah. he has really a broad view of uh, these problems linked to innovation, uh, new product formulation uh, from a business perspective, from a regulatory perspective. So uh, this interview will be very, very interesting. But um, before digging into the technical topics uh, i know that you are uh, again also studying in in us well <laughs> you are not that's, happy of your PhD. that's true that's true that's <laughs> true i never stop studying it feels like no, no, um, so i'm uh, currently enrolled at uh, fordham law school and i'm doing my lm in us law and it's very interesting because despite is not specifically focusing on the um, food law it's still interesting for me to enrich me with a, a broader perspective of U.S. law, um, which is especially important in a jurisdiction where case law is much more relevant than in Europe. And a lot of principles are developed by courts more than administrative bodies. And so I felt that I needed that. Um, and at the same time, while I'm a student, I'm also somehow a teacher because I collaborate from time to time with the University of Trent, although remotely. And uh, a couple of years ago with my colleague, Elisa Ocelli from Ferrero, we were uh, the first one to develop a food law legal clinic. There are not those many legal clinics around the Euro in Italy. So we developed this legal clinic uh, with the University of Trent to, to help students to touch with their own hands, uh, problems of the food industry. And we simulated a case uh, of interaction between a legal team and a marketing team. I think the students had, uh, I think it had the excitement of being able to go above and beyond uh, what they were studying on books and uh, having a bit more practical learning about how things are going on in, in the food industry. And it was a great experience. Yeah, and yeah, the education is different in Europe and the US um, because in Europe, at least in the civil law countries, we tend to go to law school um, right after high school. Um, meanwhile, in the US, um, you can enter a law school only after you're done with your undergrad students. And so, uh, studies, sorry. 
And uh, so despite uh, a JD is only three years long, at the end of the day, uh, once you're done with your JD, you probably have between six or uh, uh, five years of university education in the US. So to some extent it's comparable uh, to Europe uh, or, or uh, civil law countries in Europe. Um, although I would say in a, as an example, Italian law school, you focus your entire time on legal topics. Meanwhile, uh, at least in the US, it's possible to have an undergrad in uh, sciences or biology and then going on with a JD. Um, so in my career, I come across experts of patent law or experts of food law who had the opportunity to further deepen um, food science topics. Meanwhile, I think that uh, Italian and European students have less this opportunity because of the curriculum of law schools in Europe. Yeah. We should do another degree in food science then, Francesco, yeah. <laughs> when you finish up. <laughs> I, don't know. There, I don't know if I'm ready for science. that, but yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see. No, it's, it's very true what you are saying about the advantage of knowing the two systems. I don't know if you're aware that my degree thesis was about alternative dispute resolution systems, and it was on comparative uh, procedural uh, criminal law. So it was about plea bargaining in US and equivalent alternative dispute resolution systems around the world. So it was really interesting for me also to understand how common law uh, works because when you face consumer issues, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you have to know it. It's totally different than, than the European civil law legal system. So yeah, it was great. Yeah, um, and, I, and I'm not surprised because to some extent, um, quite some people in the uh, legal department of the University of Trento uh, started their career at the University of Turin uh, uh -huh. with a comparative school there, Ayani and uh, the entire yep. School of Comparative Law. So there's a lot of connection between Trento and the University of Turin. So not, not surprised that we can have similar <laughs> background from an educational standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, have exposure to both systems is very important also for food law because basically we have Codex Alimentarius, the European system, the American system, and all the rest of the world. It's I'm not saying copy pasting from from the two big food law structures, but uh, if you manage to understand both systems, you 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 certainly have the instruments to understand how much of the policies around food uh, are are shaped in 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 all the countries in the world. Um, but. Coming back to innovation and your specific expertise, you always follow very closely these, these, these branches of the food law innovation in products development. So you are very familiar probably with um, novel food applications in EU, grass application in US. So can you maybe elaborate a bit more uh, about your experience and especially try to explain in simple terms why we always heard that EU system is based on the precautionary principle. So it's praised for its high food safety standards, but on the other side is heavily criticized uh, because it's uh, sometimes stopping or slowing innovation. While on the other side, the US system, at least in Europe, is seen as something extremely liberal where you can place on the market more or less everything. And in my opinion, it's, it's not exactly like that. You have procedures, you have... Uh, you have certain principles, okay? You cannot exactly market what you want uh, anytime. So I'm, I'm eager to know your your Yeah, your, and, uh, and obviously, of that. again, as a disclaimer, I, I won't talk about any of impossible food of summation, course. but I'm, I'm happy to share a couple of ideas um, on what I've experienced over the years. So first of all, I would like to say that I um, take a bit with a grain of salt, uh, this overly broad assumption about the two systems. Um, exactly. And the more you deep dive into the two, the more you realize that there are more things in common than differences. And I think uh, people tend to overemphasize differences just based on semantics or different terminology. Um, because uh, some people, Obviously, um, the GRASS system is not an approval system, and we all know that. 
Um, that doesn't mean there is no involvement of FDA in the review of the submission. Um, and so, and, and increasingly more and more companies decide to uh, do a self grasp notification, but with a notification to FDA without just doing a self uh, grasp assessment by themselves because of the importance of having an authority endorsing the safety and the rigorous assessment that uh, the company has done. And additionally, we know that uh, a few years ago, FDA finalized, and it took 20 years almost for the agency to finalize the rule on the GRASS uh, program, which requires uh, quite some rigorous, uh, let's say, burdens in convening the expert panel for evaluating the GRASS status for an intended use of an ingredient. So it's not that in the US is like the far west where everyone can go to the market with any type of ingredient. Uh, I would say that this is probably more for small player, but big players cannot afford that. Uh, but on the other end, I can see even in Europe, I've seen a lot of small enterprises over the years. They didn't have a clue that what they were doing could have been possibly a novel food in Europe, or they were importing foods from third countries, and they didn't even know that a certain plant variety could have been considered a novel food. Uh, and then I think there are interesting, um, you know, interesting examples on um, how the two system perceive the other. So in Europe, people tend to believe that uh, European food is safer on a, as a general assumption. But if we think to the partially hydrogenated fats, which are notoriously unhealthy for consumers, uh, while FDA was quick enough to say they're no longer grass in the United States, the European Union hasn't determined that uh, with a legal binding uh, tool or instrument that they are not longer can be using in food production. Um, so that's very interesting because there's no debate there about the safety. Um, and I wonder why in this case, uh, a lot of people are not more vocal about the fact that the European Union should protect the uh, safety of consumers. On the other hand, um, a lot of people tend to overemphasize the US as home for innovation. Uh, but if we think to the system of the standard of identity in the US and how old they are, because some of them, they even uh, date <laughs> oh. back to the yeah. 40s or 50s yeah. when adulteration was quite common. And some of them were developed even after the uh, Great Depression. So yeah. um, a lot when of things, people, yeah. We're when, adding when like people, chalk in flour, or doing this gross food fraud. Yeah, it's totally so, different now. Uh, funny enough, uh, these are still there. Uh, they curb significantly the ability to innovate in certain space, uh, like their ingredients. Um, so I wonder whether uh, the assumption that the US is on for food innovation is correct in that space. So these are just a few examples of um, how I think that we tend to overemphasize differences. Um, and then there is also another element um, that I think is food for thought, is that um, what I notice is that uh, as a trend I see, we always have a villain ingredient and there are pattern of, of these stigmatizing single ingredients. And funny enough, um, the reason why uh, partially hydrogenated fats were developed where back in between the 50s and the 80s was because, uh, obviously because of cost factor, but also because we were trying to get away from animal fats. We thought the saturated fat were the evil. And in order to replace that, we ended up with something that was even worse than what we had before. Um, so what I'm noticing, and this is, I think, a, a trend that I see, I see around the world, is that while a lot of people advocate for precaution, 
and banning single ingredient. And I'm thinking about uh, the saga of the titanium dioxide in Europe. I was thinking the same, exactly yeah. the same. <laughs> the minute after you ban an ingredient, you start to replace it. Mm. Uh, but the interesting thing is that we don't do uh, an equation to understand whether what we replace the old ingredient is equally safe or whether there are benefits of staying with the old ingredient instead of replacing with the new. And, um, and th that in particular, that saga to me was very interesting um, because another time it showed me um, how science is used sometimes in a political way, uh, especially on the European uh, uh, on the European scene. Um, because well, funny enough, uh, for many years, uh, EFSA had rebutted any concern about the safety of the ingredient, uh, including the last report of Francis. And then while she, it was reevaluating the additive, it was like a 180 degree shift um, and they say, we don't have enough data to conclude that the ingredient is safe. Um, which to some extent to me, anticipate the precaution to the uh, assessment phase, which is kind of scary to me mm. um, because I'm wondering, do all food ingredients undergo the same burden of proof? Do we have to demonstrate that any and whatever ingredient we use is absolutely safe and we need to demonstrate it above and beyond any doubt? Or was all this uh, test only used for this specific ingredient? Um, and in fact, it was interesting that the way other authorities around the world reacted, and I'm more interested about Canadian authorities, Australian authorities that are probably closer to the European Union, the way they yeah. deal with risks, and they confirmed that the ingredient, they didn't have elements to conclude that the ingredient was unsafe. They didn't say we don't have enough elements to demonstrate it's safe. They say we don't have elements to believe that it's unsafe. Um, so to some extent, the burden of proof was shift in that case. Um, and I found it extremely interesting also because it let me think about um, some classes of philosophy that I took when I was at high school uh, from Karl Popper that he was saying that any scientific theory is subject to be revisited and rebutted by new, uh, new evidence. Um, so what I, I feel is that uh, consumers and citizens on average would like to have a food 100% safe with absolutely no risk, which to some extent reminds me these classes of uh, Popper in which was saying, you know, if you have a, a dogma or an axiom, you're not any longer in the scientific space, you're in a sort of religious space or another space. Um, instead, I think that people should be educated to understand the risk exists is part of our life. And, uh, and we need to understand uh, the balance between risks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think one of the uh, shortcoming of certain risk analysis model is that they don't take into account the benefits for the consumers. Um, because we all the time focus only on the safety of the ingredient, where we don't also consider other elements uh, in the equation who have a broader risk analysis model. Um, mm -hmm. And so we miss out, I think, on, on other um, benefit from food innovation. Yeah. Uh, a lot to chew on. Uh, also, this uh, aspect of... Uh, the consumers that uh, would like to have or think they have food that is 100% safe, it's interesting because it's a lot about also communication of the risk, scientific communication that is a topic that we, we face with other guests as well. So it's uh, sometimes what is uh, perceived by us in, in the, with, with the technical knowledge is completely different from what is perceived by consumers. The scientific assessments are not communicated properly. And so there is a huge gap in my opinion between our world and the consumers. And the, despite certain efforts from our um, EFSA in Europe and other authorities, 
you know, we have to work a lot, I, I think, on consumers' education to, to try to, to, to bridge this gap, because otherwise uh, the, 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 the situation might become dangerous. Because as, as you mentioned, in, in Europe, this precautionary principle has been often instrumentalized for, for political reasons. And uh, uh, my perception, and I raised this question recently in several conferences, speaking of new gene editing techniques and uh, other you know, kind of innovative um, processes is uh, my, my, my perception is that we are moving to a system where the pre-market authorization is, uh, is becoming the rule in Europe. And that's, that's, that's scary for innovation because we're speaking of, uh, of procedures that might take two or three years, uh, need a lot of investments, and uh, and the, 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 as, as you mentioned, this this shift of the precautionary principle to a phase that is even preceding the risk uh, the, the risk evaluation in the risk assessment phase is, is very it's very dangerous because the risk to to block a, a lot uh, of of things. On, on the other side, I, I want to pick up on another idea that you raise. The fact that in the US you can do a self-assessment grass, so a self-assessment safety evaluation of an ingredient might be a pro in certain situation, but in other is a big con because I assisted a lot of startups developing innovative products. And if you want to find investors, if you want to partner with big companies, if you need support, uh, sometimes it's much better to have an approval, a piece of paper that say that you can do that. This has been approved or at least has been evaluated by the FDA. So that's why I would send my grass, for instance, to the FDA, at least to have an answer where the FDA said, well, I have nothing against your ingredient. Your assessment look, look you know, reasonable. The ingredient is safe. Well, in, in Europe, despite this rigid system, many companies are flying blind are putting on the market ingredients without knowing exactly if they are novel or not novel. And we have now blatant cases of non-compliance, like for CBDs, for instance, where it's clear that the you position, and I know also in US, you speak a lot about CBDs, is that those you know chemical extracted CBDs are novel. You cannot enrich the products with CBDs. You cannot market them as such, but still the market is floated. So, uh you know yeah uh, i'll try to tackle um your thinking uh, from the beginning because it was like yeah. a long yeah. statement so um <laughs> let's go back to uh consumer expectation um and i would like to to give another uh powerful example that uh sometimes me makes me laugh uh, so over the pandemic we witnessed uh sudden spike in baking abilities of people at home, doing all kinds of experiments with sourdough, selecting all kinds of strains and so on. Um, so let's think about a moment about that. Um, what's going on in our own kitchen? What is the level of hygiene that people have in their own kitchen and what strains they're dealing with? And on the other end, we really bother ourselves with the QPS system, uh, assessing um, microbial, microbial culture, the safety of microbial culture and so on. But consumers don't realize that even in their own homes, they can have significant risks. Not to mention more the people who were trading, exchanging sourdough. And every time that I explain uh, to people that when they uh, you know, get some sourdough with some random friend, they also get any ecosystem they might have in their kitchen. And it's, to me, it's quite gross, to be honest with you, but uh, <laughs> people seem not to realize <laughs> that this is equally dangerous. And, um, but why? Why? Because that ecosystem of our kitchen feels our under control. And there are studies on uh, risk perception. And I think the EFSA is doing a great um, job in trying to uh, communicate better, understand risk perception by people. Um, meanwhile, other, when the people are not in control any longer because they feel it's overly complicated for them to understand or is way too remote from them, 
uh, they, then is when they start to have distrust. Um, and so I think it's extremely important to um, invest in education, especially scientific education. And if you look at the uh, most recent Eurobarometer report on science and citizen, it was extremely, extremely interesting that a lot of Mediterranean countries have very, very low uh, science acumen. And guess what is where some unethical player can thrive on that and developing marketing strategy because uh, we don't have to think that it's the evil companies and the consumer on the other side. There are evil companies, there are good companies and consumer, there are evil company equally taking advantage of these situations. So um, there's a lot of competition there. So uh, that's, uh, that, that's a point. Then getting to the other topic of um, self, uh, self-glass. One thing that people I think don't fully appreciate is that uh, the grass status generally recognized as safe generally means by experts and based on public proceedings, which means published data. Um, so unless there are published data out there that support your conclusion, you are not able to come to the conclusion that your ingredient is safe. And it's very interesting if we compare the European system to the grass system, because technically speaking, a company could submit, uh, and that's probably what EFSA would like, entire reports of studies to EFSA without publishing them. And so at the end of the day, uh, they would be obviously evaluated by the expert of EFSA and then uh, subject to the, under the new transparency rule to the public comment period. But technically they don't, those data don't undergo first uh, peer review process. They don't undergo first to, uh, they could, let's say, could not undergo a public debate first, which that's typically what happens in the US. And so that's another element that, that has to be uh, evaluated. And when you mentioned CBD, the concern of FDA are still there, the liver toxicity and, uh, and safety issues. And, and it's interesting that the UK for FSA is going on yeah. and solicited that scientific evidence to yeah. be able to arrive to a conclusion. So um, I'm looking at this with uh, uh, a lot of interest because I'm really curious to understand where we will land on. Um, on the other end, there is also another element that is the specifications. Um, and you might have noticed, I mean, I think you, you know very well that there might be several submissions for the same ingredient um, under the grass system. Yep. Uh, also because company uh, don't feel that a previous submission can cover their manufacturing process. Um, with a novel food system, if you look at it, um, on one end, you might ensure obviously data protection and exclusivity of use, but assuming that the specification are out there and the manufacturing process is described in the union list of novel food, technically anyone that respects the specification, although maybe changing some step in the manufacturing process, which are not relevant, could do that without submitting anything. That opens an interesting discussion on what is a significant change in the manufacturing process. And my feeling is that uh, there might be significant changes or what people or some companies might not believe there are significant changes that are done in Europe, but the products still fulfill the specs that are laid down uh, in the approval. Um, meanwhile, on the other end, you see several submissions to FDA for changes in yeah. the manufacturing process. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. And uh, in Europe, honestly, this is one of my biggest concern when I face the novel food uh, applications. Because uh, uh, also a minimum change in the specification of the ingredients. Let's imagine that it's uh, coming from a plant, it's a botanical. Also, if you use 
three different species under the same genus of the plant. Can yeah. we do a unique application or we should do three applications if you change a bit the process? And this would be interesting also for the insect market because now there are some applications that are covered by confidentiality, others not covered. And, uh, but if you change the process, if you change how to feed, for instance, the insects, you might have new risks. So uh, I, I agree, the, 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 the grass, the, the grass. Correct uh, me if I'm wrong, because uh, as you are, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in uh, uh, the legal space in Europe more than I am, the binding part is what is included in the union list in the implementing act of the yeah. commission. Of course. What is included in the assessment of EFSA is not the binding part of the approval unless it becomes uh, part of the approval. And maybe in the recitals, there might be, although the recitals are not binding at all. So I'm wondering, yeah how much the assessment becomes then part of the legal act, which then approves the novel food? <laughs> good question, good question. But yeah, mm, yeah, I would say that the union at least is very focused on, on, the, on the output, on the ingredient that has been approved, yeah. not on the process, but still as an advisor, I would not feel comfortable in saying to a company, go to market under this already approved, you know, <laughs> application. Yeah, and, and now when I new, know that yeah. you have. A yeah, really now under the new process. novel food regulation, you also have the avenue of the consultation, which uh, before was uh, exactly. informal and now has been formal. Now it's formal, so it's much more binding yeah. as well. But this leads to my, you know, last point about this, this talk. I don't want to abuse of your time. Uh, which is how much do you think that uh, timing from one side and uh, transparency on the other side might have an impact uh, on businesses when they decide to invest on a new uh, ingredient to try to get an approval? Because sometimes they get discouraged by long timings, like uh, the novel food in you that it's taking around three years. Also, if by the rules, you should be out of the <laughs> grass yeah. in 18 months. Um, sometimes they are discouraged by costs. But my perception is that big companies are more discouraged by long timings, uncertainties in the output, and eventually also by too much transparency. Because as you mentioned, sometimes the, the, the procedures are might be opaque, sometimes even to... Uh, open and if you don't get protections for your investments, what's the point in waiting three years to spend millions or tens of millions to get an approval when then you cannot <laughs> exploit it, at least for a few years, like a patent? You know, it's 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 quite daunting this this the situation. Okay, you you put a lot of efforts in get an approval and then you you don't ripe the benefits. It's a yeah, I, I, yes, it's very I, tricky. I, yeah. I think the current system in Europe um, could be improved. Um, um, first of all, um, one of the rationale for the new novel food regulation was um, increasing the ability of small and medium enterprises to be able to uh, enter the market with innovative foods. And certainly uh, tools like consultation or the fact that uh, there is a desk, a help desk, a desk uh, um, has gone in that direction. On the other end, you are totally right. Um, the complexity of the regulation creates a cost. And um, if you look at the uh, biggest player, those are usually the ones that submit novel foods and we have the uh, scientific strength to be able to carry out studies and uh, uh, amass the scientific evidence that is needed. So I think to some extent uh, that goal wasn't reached. Um, equally, you're right about transparency and the burden of transparency. What I usually say is that unfortunately with the transparency regulation, uh, there were two drivers. There was this uh, need to ensure transparency in light of the glyphosate saga, which was an issue about pesticides. And you subjected the pesticide industry and the food industry to the same rules. But 
the deliverable of the goals of these two industries are completely different. On one end, you have big, big companies, few players, and pesticide are perceived as a negative uh, technology by consumer. On the other end, have many more players, smaller players that uh, deliver innovation to the consumer. So to me, the shortcoming was to subject both the food industry and the uh, pesticide industry to the same stand. When I think that consumer had different expectation about the two. And then uh, the other thing is that, uh, as you mentioned, is uh, there's an issue of IP protection, um, but also these early notification of any kind of studies. Um, and I think there was a bit of uh, disalignment between um, how the policymaker thought the industry works and what is indeed the reality of our everyday working companies. So this set of rules started from the assumption that basically um, you have a, a prototype that is already ready to scale up, you go through all the studies, and then you are ready to submit everything to authorities. I said, this is not the case. Um, like innovation is always uh, uh, stop and go. There's always trials, they're always failure and failure are part of innovation. I mean, uh, I don't think that we invented the car without making any errors in doing that. Um, and instead, now you need to submit any study and even the studies that don't, I mean, studies may go wrong for several reasons. Maybe a rat uh, didn't grow well, because not because the ingredient was not safe, but because of issues at the lab level and so on. But then that could be perceived by consumer as a lack of transparency or bad data that are not evaluated. So I think that um, we could have done a better job. And it's no surprise, and it's every uh, everyone eyes that, like a lot of companies now are starting food innovation outside Europe uh, because of the burden, the regulatory burden. And it's under the eyes of everyone that a lot of innovative products are first tasted by consumers around the world. And the last to consume them are probably Europeans or other countries that are a bit more uh, risk adverse. Um, so that's quite interesting to me. Um, and I think that with the challenges the European Union will face, especially with the energy crisis, uh, the commodity crisis and so on, I think it, it will be worth uh, reconsidering, uh, you know, like um, some of these, uh, the regulatory framework and uh, create avenues for innovation that are a bit uh, more uh, industry friendly. And I'm not saying that you need to give up safety. I'm just saying that you need to create the space for companies to be able to operate. Totally agree. And um, well, we can discuss this for hours, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm sure. And your example about glyphosate, for instance, was very, very interesting because uh, pesticides at the end of the day have a role in, the, in, the, in, in agriculture, in the supply chains. And just yesterday, I read an article where one of our most conservative farmers association was complaining because of the targets of the EU Commission about pesticides reduction and was saying this year in Italy, we risk to produce 30% less than last year due to the lack of pesticides that is, of course, dependent also on on the political, economical, macro situation, not just by the reduction target of the commission, but you know, as, as you mentioned, yeah, but, it's, uh, it's, it's a wheel I, I, that goes I round between and round. the lines, and I don't want to mention the name, but I guess it's the same association also that has been opposing biotechnology. Yeah, um, it's open to them. And, uh, yeah, and releasing the to field. Yeah. Uh, and uh, although despite of that, a uh, massive amount of uh, biotech feed was imported into the European Union over the years by the same producer who opposed biotechnology for the releasing field, uh, which I found kind of interesting. Yeah. But uh, um, <laughs> okay. I'm not part of that organization. I think they have the reasons why they want to advocate for certain ideas. We, we, we will do another one on the farm to fork strategy and uh, <laughs> innovation in the agriculture, I would say. Um, 
Thank you for your time. It has been real uh, pleasure to speak with you again and uh, a lot to learn for all of us. Uh, do you have any final uh, thought that you want to share with our, especially with the younger professionals that are listening, anything about new projects you are pursuing? Yeah, the floor is yours. for No, I, I just think that uh, I'm always willing to support anyone. Um, with possible question about their career. So they will find me on LinkedIn um, because if there was something that I really lacked at the beginning of my career was direction. Uh, but that was probably also because almost 15 years ago, food law was still at the embryonal level. It was still a niche. Uh, now it's a broader community, although I have the pleasure of like to know you, Cesare, but I think that everyone else, like it's like a small club and it feels really great to be part of this, this club because I, I think we, we contribute to the future of the world because feeding people is a big, big mission and uh, how you regulate food has an impact on that. So I think that uh, whoever wants to embrace this career has a lot of opportunities in front of him or her. Great. So join the club, uh, the Food Law Club, and uh, we will leave Francesco contacts in uh, now in the closing slides. And um, thank you again, Francesco. Enjoy Thanks a lot. Your day in New York City. I'm so jealous. Come on. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Have a good one. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye.